this meeting to order. Um, any additions or changes to the agenda, anybody? Uh, no, no. And um, what I'd like to do uh, since we're doing this remote and not in person is go through a roll call of agencies. And so we can actually hear everyone who's here for the record for which agency, okay? Okay. All right, for the Regional Planning Board. Here, David Boter. For uh, Centro. Schultz. Uh, City of Syracuse Administration. Uh, I think that's me, Mary Robinson. Yep, that is you, yes. Uh, City of Syracuse uh, Division of Planning. Allison Bodine. Welcome. Uh, City of Syracuse DPW. Anyone? I don't think they're on. Empire State Development. A center State CEO. I appear to be it. I'm here. New York State DEC. New York State DOT. Okay, so we got Dave Roth, Katie Bergen, Rich Sazak, and Mark Fischetz on the on the line too. At the whole department here. Okay. The Thruway Authority. Uh, Jaron George is on. Welcome. Uh, Onondaga County DOT. Marty Voss, Jim. And Onondaga County Legislator. I believe Cody Kelly is connected. I don't know if you can hear us or not. Mr. Kelly. Oh. And Sakpa. In Costa here. Oh. Ah. I have no message from Mr. Kelly. He's Mr. Cody has no audio. Okay. Well, that's fine, Mr. Cody. You can just text me and I'll read your I'll read anything you have to say into the record. Okay. Anything else, Jim, before we do minutes? No. Okay. okay. The minutes from anybody? Or anybody would like to make a motion on minutes from the last meeting? I'm moving. I'm moving, Megan. Thank you, Brian. Do we have a second? Marty, thank you very much. All in favor? Any opposed? Aye. How about just any opposed? <laughs> All right. Hearing none, motion passed. Do you need to do roll call on votes like that or no? Forget no. It. We're only, we all, we're only going to do roll call if there's any nay votes. If there's any nay votes, we'll do an individual agency by agency roll call so everyone can go on the record whether they're voting yay or nay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. UPWP status report. And normally I go through this item by item, but as next year's work program is on the agenda, as is a summary of this past year, I'm going to skip that in the interest of getting everyone off the call as fast as possible. Uh, but it's there for you to read. And if you have any questions that you would like answered that I do not answer during my presentation, feel free to ask them at that time. And I'll uh, give you any answers you need. Short and sweet. Sounds good to me. All right. I guess we'll move on. Update on the I-81 Viaduct Project from New York State DOT. You got it. Mr. Frechette is here. All righty. Thanks, Megan and Jim. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, last time... We got together was uh, in October. I think it was October seventh. Uh, was the planning committee, <clears throat> and DOT was at the process of, of closing the comment period at at that time. Uh, when last time we we got together, so I'll give you an update from essentially from that point forward. Um, but we had had the public hearings and and a lot of uh, robust robust. Outreach with stakeholders and in August, uh, September. Uh, in total, we ended up receiving more than uh, 7,500 comments. Uh, I want you to stop and just think about how much that is, 7,500 comments. Uh, it, it was very significant. I don't think in New York State we've ever seen um, the magnitude of comments that uh, uh, on, on any project. Uh, in, in comparison to uh, the preliminary DEIS that we put out in May of, of 2019, we ended up getting um, 1,200 comments that we received. So uh, good six times more than, more than that. So I'm just gonna give you a few of the topics that, that have come in. Um, 
Probably one of the one of the largest things that uh, we continue to uh, engage the community on and and make plans for in the future is is really the creation of jobs. And I am going to talk a little bit about what we've done on that platform, the jobs platform, uh, something that uh, we're very proud of at, at DOT and partnering with the city of Syracuse and, and Onondaga County on. Recording uh, so in progress. My apologies, the recording was not active, uh, it is being recorded. And as a reminder to everybody, we are being live streamed to YouTube. I apologize for the interruption, Mark. Nope, not a problem. Uh, other comments, um, as we move closer and closer to construction, uh, there is lots more specifics that people want, want to talk about. Uh, one of the largest things that uh, the community wants to talk about is protecting the environment. And, and that certainly is a important um, consideration in any uh, project, much less one that uh, has so much construction in it. Uh, so there was, there was uh, a lot of comments related to air quality, uh, control measures during, during construction, uh, dust control, uh, lead exposure from, from the paint on beams, uh, hazardous waste disposal, a lot of conversations about noise abatement, uh, we're proposing uh, 19 noise barriers as part of the project. Uh, issues such as economic analysis, uh, social justice, environmental justice, um, vibration monitoring in and around the hospitals um, were just a few of the environmental topics that came up and it came up a lot. Um, the roundabout was a very controversial issue over the summer, the one that was proposed by MLK. And I think DOT heard loud and clear that it was a non-starter uh, to put a roundabout there. Um, we, we've branched into talking a lot more about the construction practices. And I think that's really important going forward. Uh, things like how are we implementing the uh, traffic management plans, uh, requests for uh, community liaisons and a public outreach center. We had closed our outreach center uh, because of COVID uh, a, a couple of years ago. It is our plan to reopen an outreach center uh, to give the public the opportunity to come in and, and, and talk to people from the project team or even during the construction phases to have that point of contact to um, engage with, with DOT. We had lots of new recommendations as part of the 7,500 comments, uh, both big and small. Um, many of them, I, I think people heard in the newspapers, things like the Sky Bridge or the Harriet Tubman Memorial Bridge uh, to, to considering planting this type of tree at this intersection. Um, one of the common things that we heard, and we got a lot of comments on trying to reduce the overall footprint of the business loop 81 through Syracuse uh, to allow for increases in, in economic development opportunities. That was one of the things. A lot of discussion on property takes. Uh, Prior to the public hearing, DOT had sent letters out to all property owners uh, that um, is anticipated to, to have any property takes on. So there's been a lot of engagement with uh, businesses, property owners um, related to any, any, any necessary temporary easements we need for drainage or to build a sidewalk or whatever. Uh, Wilson Park. Uh, is a gem in, in the city of Syracuse. We have a lot of upgrades to the Wilson Park as part of, of the alternatives. Uh, streetscape enhancements, uh, aesthetic features, there's conversations about art, um, and many, many more. I mean, I could talk hours about what we've received, but I wanted to talk a little bit about the process of what we do with, with these comments. So the 
7,500 comments came in um, as part of the NEPA comment process. We, of course, review all comments. Um, and I got to tell you, uh, for doing this in uh, for, for many, many years, we, we tend to, in central New York, get a lot of very good recommendations. Um, DOT is listening to what people have to say as, as to what their recommendations are. And we are taking every comment into consideration. Many times this leads to uh, additional analysis or new required engineering that we need to do. Uh, an example of this was um, between the preliminary DEIS and the, the DEIS, we, we added exit three. Uh, along Interstate 481. There was a lot of, um, it wasn't part of the project initially, um, and, and the decisions to do that requires a lot of uh, modifications to the, to the document, but also a lot of engineering to support the decision-making and to really research what the issues are that people are bringing to the table. Ultimately, all of the responses are categorized into uh, like comments, and we have, we develop a response for, for each comment. Um, what that really means is uh, there's a lot of supporters of, of different alternatives. Those are put into the same categories, and then we respond to, to each of them so that when you, um, when the FEIS is released to the public, the community will be able to go find their comments, uh, it will be included in the document. They'll be able to see the response that DOT has for each of those. So from, from the time that uh, we released the DEIS, we have been working with our federal partners at Federal Highway Administration um, on response comment and changes uh, to the project. Uh, the uh, comments uh, included within the FEIS will um, with all will will be included within the FEIS with with all the responses. Um, there's really been quite a bit of work done to date addressing the community's comments. Uh, we don't have all of the approvals at this point in time. We need to seek uh, multiple approvals through through DOT. And, and FHWA, and once we get to that point, uh, then DOT would be releasing uh, what's called the final design report, final environmental impact statement. That will come out with a 30-day review, uh, and it will include all these comments and responses, uh, and people will be notified uh, of that. Um, from that document, uh, that document turns into what's called the record of decision and that closes the preliminary design phases. On many projects, the FEIS and record of decision is one document. On this project, based on the, the nature of the project, it was, it was determined to, to do that in two steps. So that's kind of, that's a, in a nutshell, what's going on with, with our NEPA processing but there are a lot of other parallel activities going on at the same time. Uh, today, the planning committee is going to be asked to vote on the long range transportation plan. A DOT uh, has been working with SMTC on the development of, of the 81 component of that and, and other components uh, of that. There are um, $500 million or more construction contracts there are project requirements that are typically not done um, on, on other projects, but they are required on, on these, these projects, a project like ID1. Uh, those include uh, the cost schedule risk assessment that DOT has completed with FHWA back in November. Uh, it includes a initial financial plan, um, which has been, uh, Put together a project management plan for the construction phases, which really gets into the resources necessary to, to build the project. Um, and then financing. So financing is, is one of the things that um, 
will come before this committee, uh, the planning committee and the policy committee for the, the next phases of, of construction. Uh, DOT had submitted uh, an application uh, last <clears throat> summer. It was called the infra application. Uh, we were not selected. Uh, this project was not selected, uh, but we had requested hundreds of millions of dollars for the project. And the new with the new transportation bill, uh, I don't know if Jim will talk about that um, later today at all, but there are some new programs, one being the Reconnecting Communities Program. We do believe that the 81 project um, would compete very well in that platform. And we'll be looking to um, apply uh, when, when the opportunity presents itself, which we think will probably be sometime in 2022. But on the, on the financing side of things, um, we had put funding forth on this project through the record of decision, through the preliminary design phases. We, we currently don't have established um, the final design funding, the right-of-way acquisition funding, or the construction funding. Uh, both the planning and policy committee does have a voting role on the finances for the future phases of the project. Um, Jim, SMTC and DOT have, have started the conversation at least uh, on, on those next steps going forward. Uh, Jim will reach out to you um, when we get to the appropriate stage uh, about setting a, a meeting um, to, to address the financial side of, of those future funds. Uh, pretty exciting yesterday. I, I think most people know that uh, last state budget, uh, the governor put out $800 million uh, as part of the, the budget talks or the proposal budget, there was an additional $1.1 billion uh, proposed in the, in the state budget. So uh, a lot of things are coming together on, on the project. Along with, along with that is really what's going on on the local hiring side. So one of the most uh, discussed issues throughout the the, the project community outreach has been the need to have a local hiring preference and to provide the opportunity to those seeking to work on the, on the project. Uh, the city of Syracuse through their Syracuse Build Initiative uh, has aligned with the Urban Jobs Task Force and many other local jobs advocates to begin the ID1 Jobs Big Table. I was really tasked with discussing the opportunity available for employment, uh, the needs for increased training, and how a local hiring preference could be included on the project. Um, those meetings that this, the city has uh, held and, and DOT has participated in um, has led uh, us to formulate a, another working group uh, a smaller working group that's made up of uh, DOT, FHWA, City of Syracuse, Urban Jobs Task Force, uh, Legal Services of Central New York, and representatives of Senator Schumer and, and Gillibrand's office. Um, over the last four months, uh, we have gotten together and we've developed a SEP 14 application uh, to establish what the local hiring preference would be in central New York for the project. Uh, this would be a incentive to our contractors to fulfill um, that preference and, and really support the local hiring, local hiring goal. We did a uh, peer exchange with Colorado DOT and, and their partners that had established a, a similar hiring preference for the I-70 project in Denver. Uh, the peer exchange really afforded us the opportunity to hear the, the pros and cons of what went well that project is built and, and how they incentivize their, their contracts. A lot of conversation about training people, training people to be into, in, into the 
into the uh, um, the work trades. So this this work group uh, took what we learned from this peer exchange, um, and we formulated um, a SEP 14 that was uh, submitted to FHWA in December. Um, we have received comments on that, and we are working with our federal partners on that. But our proposed goal for local hiring was uh, is being recommended at uh, 15%. Um, we, uh, through research that the Urban Jobs Task Force did on uh, projects that were performed by the city school district, uh, Syracuse City School District, to, to renovate the local schools, uh, the group did some data that, that aligned us to, to tr really take a look at, at trying to establish that goal at, at 15%. Uh, there's still a lot to do on the work initiative platform. It's not approved at this point in time. Uh, it is the SEP 14 application really affords us the opportunity to apply to use it. Uh, but we're optimistic uh, that this will get approved and that we will have a, a local hiring preference, which uh, when you take a look at this project and, and we, we are estimating uh, over 7 million hours of, of construction work uh, to have a 15% uh, local hiring uh, will really be a a very positive for uh, people within Onondaga County. So um, more to come on that as we get approvals, as we progress towards the construction phases. Uh, but I wanted to share that this morning because I think this is, uh, is very good news for uh, Central New York. So I'm gonna stop there. I'd be happy to try to take any questions anybody has. Thank you, Mark. Any questions for Mark? Yeah, Mark, there's a, <clears throat> my understanding is there's a number of groups or a few groups that are um, not happy with the DOT decision and they're trying to cause problems. Have they been effective in slowing this down? And uh, if you could go over a new timeline, new construction timeline, and, and where you guys think you'll actually be, um, you know, putting shovels in the ground? Yeah, Brian, the, uh, there, are, there are groups that um, uh, are strongly advocating for maintaining the interstate through Syracuse. Um, we did have a viaduct alternative that we carried um, and, and still carry in, in the documents. Um, we just believe the community grid is, a, um, is the preferred alternative in, in comparison. Um, related to the time frame, it is our goal to get to the record of decision uh, early this year. Uh, we still have to put out the FEIS to get to that record of decision. Um, and it's still our plan to get the construction contracts, um, uh, have our contractors on board for phase one by the end of the year. Uh, we are proposing to do five uh, construction contracts in phase one, uh, two of them along 481 and three of them downtown um, within the city. And um, we are, um, each of those um, needs to go through a process to secure the contractor that really can't can occur until after we get to the record of decision. So I don't anticipate that we will have significant construction. We, we would want to get shovels in the ground and by the end of 2022, but all five of those construction contracts uh, active and, and going forward early in 23. Thanks, Mark. Any other questions for Mark? Mark, I, I um, heard your comments on the, the 1.9 billion and that's all state money that has been appropriated basically as a construction, uh, construction fund or construction monies and now you're now you apply to the federal government to get the eighty percent or so that the federal government is going to put up. Is that the way the process works? Well, uh, Dave, the the um, the transportation bill that was just expired 
ex just executed, not expired. There one was there was one that expired, but one that was executed. I think it was in October of this year. Uh, provided uh, New York State with um, uh, significant more federal funding than it has in in the past. I think that's good for everybody in Central New York um, and New York State. Um, for this project, the commitment from the state to move forward with. Uh, if the 1.1 were to be approved in the state budget, um, it really is the commitment that the, the project is going to be moving forward. It is a combination of both state and federal funding. Uh, part of what we're going to ask the Planning and Policy Committee to vote on is, is just that, the approval of the, um, uh, the, the funding for the construction phases much like this committee does for every federal aid project done in, in, in central New York. Um, so related to the, to the grants, like Dave, I, I know you're familiar that we submitted the infra grant last year and requested hundreds of millions of dollars that, that really would just assist with having more funding for the, for the project uh, that could free up other, federal funding to be used for something else within Central New York. And uh, for, for clarity uh, in terms of where the monies are coming from and where they're going, uh, SMTC, we get an, uh, an allocation or a planning target of federal funds that we program here locally at the planning and policy committee level. The monies that are being designated for I-81 are federal funds that are being designated by New York State DOT main office in Albany. And now, because they are federal funds, um, they cannot be expended in our area, in an MPO area, without the NPO's concurrence. So that's why it's going to come to us to be added to our TIP uh, for the monies to be to be expended in our area. That was a fail save. That's why the MPOs exist. They, they exist to make sure that when federal funds are spent in an area, uh, local, the locals have some say in that process of making sure that they concur with the, expect, the proper use of those federal funds in their community. So that's kind of, you know, by definition, why the council exists in the first place. And, and Mark, um, I have one more question. Um, in the hiring preference, how was the word local defined? What's local? Yeah, the, uh, there's, um, that's being discussed right now, Dave, but um, essentially uh, there's, um, what it really tries to target is the economically depressed. It, it's not um, it's not race driven. It, it's it's uh, those areas uh, that are depressed um, that have struggled to find work, um, and uh, there is criteria that will be shared with the with the community that has been debated over the last, the last few months. But um, essentially the local hiring um, incentives doesn't mean that anybody from central New York couldn't work on the project. It's just the incentives that are built in are to really try to target some of the individuals that um, are, are in a category, economic category. Um, um, and and it's, it's both in the city of Syracuse and Onondaga County. Mark, can you explain, uh, this is Dave Bocar, um, this application you submitted to Federal Highway for training funds, how much money is being requested and what can it be used for? So on the on the training side, Dave, that's a, that's a little bit different. That is, that is um, recognizing that we're not going to be successful unless people get trained, uh, if they get into the apprenticeships or the traineeship program. So the Syracuse Build initiative that um, uh, is spearheaded by the city and the county is really trying to identify individuals. Uh, they've went through um, uh, two, two
two uh, graduations so far uh, to graduate people into um, uh, to get into the industry. And so there's been funding that's been established for that. Uh, Department of Labor has just put up a million dollars to do additional training uh, to encourage people uh, to, to get into uh, the journeymen and, and apprenticeship programs. Uh, the, those programs are being run outside of the SEP 14 application that we, we submitted or what the city of Syracuse is doing with uh, Syracuse Build. It's already been successful this fall. Um, I, I don't have the exact numbers, but uh, I know that uh, 20 individuals were selected, and I think the, the first graduation had something like 16. Uh, they just had the second graduation, and maybe if somebody's on the phone, if Mary knows or, or others have more specifics, they can speak to it. But they uh, basically have gotten people into the heavy equipment operation apprenticeship programs, which or the masonry uh, programs, um, and and will they work? Or trucking, uh, CDL working on getting CDLs. Uh, will they work on the project? They could, or they could just work on other projects. Any projects that city, county, state, state has. So on the training side of things, uh, that needs to be. Uh, there's been a lot of attention to that and. And rightfully so, because um, once these projects hit construction, uh, the, the needs are significant. Uh, we have not seen the needs for construction workers um, to this level really ever in in Central New York that that I can that I can think of. Maybe back when the interstates were initially built. So training and and getting people who are interested to work. Um, is is a component that's that's ongoing and will continue to go. I think uh, the Syracuse Build Initiative right now has funding all the way through next summer, and uh, they continue to look for more funding. The labor unions are a part of that; they've donated to that, um, and so people are like uh, a lot of businesses are looking for workers to get into their industry uh, to help. and And this one's going to take a lot of workforce to be successful. I don't understand. What is the what is step fourteen? What is that application about? So the step step fourteen step. It's SCP. It's it's um, that is just uh, a name, David. For the uh, it's it allows us to do something that we've never done before in Central New York. Step fourteen is a pilot program that federal government has to approve to allow us to, man, to mandate to our contractors to put um, a goal attainment of having the 15% local hire. So if there's, uh, if there's a thousand hours of work, what that is, is, is going to do is it's going to say 150 would come from locally. From these areas within that. So this is just, it's just the name of the application, the SEP, SEP 14 is just the name of the application. It's what we've submitted in December, and it will allow for us in our construction contracts to include uh, up to a 15% local hire initiative um, that our contractors will need to hire locally. So we have no control over who's going to get these, these contracts. And it's really to ensure that much of the workforce is coming from locally. Okay, I understand that. Um, I could just ask one more question, I guess, related. So on the training side, I'm certainly familiar with what Syracuse Build is doing. Um, but if we're gonna, if we have a goal of trying to reach 15%, it seems like we need significantly more money to be put into the training programs that we're standing up right now to try to get people ready for this construction project. And so, as I understand, just reading news reports, the demand far exceeds the training slots that are available. So does DOT 
have the ability to put money into this training initiative when it's needed, which is now, since it's too late once the construction starts, um, can we take some of this money that we're considering, right, you know, and allocate resources to have a more robust training program in our community? Yeah, we, we currently have, David, on, on all of our projects, we, we have goal attainment for training and, and apprenticeship. I shouldn't say all, I, I would say most of our, our contracts. So we write currently into, um, into our projects uh, a, a goal attainment of having X number of apprenticeship traineeship programs. So we already compensate contractors today to try and get people into, into the field, uh, whatever field that they, they wanna go to. Uh, some of these, uh, to, to, to go through the program, to graduate out of the apprenticeship programs take three years to your point. And it takes a while to work in the industry to actually um, graduate from, from that. Um, I totally agree with what you're saying related to the magnitude of money. It is something that certainly New York State can do. Um, our, as far as New York State DOT, uh, we do have programs within our, our construction uh, that does provide for uh, apprenticeship and traineeship programs, and we pay for that. Uh, if you looked at the the city's Salina State Street project. I don't know what that is uh, off the top of my head, but I would think that Mary or I think Rich Sawzak's on the phone, they'd be able to say there's a, a goal attainment to, to that $10 million project. And that starts people in the industry to be able to work at, on their trades. And, and ultimately some of those individuals uh, would work on the 81 project. Um, I think that uh, for Central New York, based on the magnitude of work that we have uh, for the 81 that's coming up, that this is training is is one of those activities that needs to be ramped up. I, I would agree with that based on the levels we're talking about. Well, that certainly strikes me the same if we're talking a $2 billion construction project and we're at most spending optimistically a million dollars a year on training right now. Let's we'll see how we're even scratching the surface given the magnitude of the project. Yeah, the, the million dollars was the Department of Labor thing, David. I mean, the, there's funding for the, the Syracuse build and, and some of the other training programs that are going on. Most of our training apprenticeship um, funding is directly related to the, the construction activities um, and, and occur once we have a contractor in place. That, that's just what DOT has. Um, but there's, there are training programs, as you know, um, that New York State implements and, and provides funding for. I'm just not the appropriate person to talk to about that. Thanks, Mark. Yep. Thank you, Mark. Last call for questions. <laughs> Thank you very Thanks. much, Mark, for that update. I really appreciate it. Yep. Okay, so moving on, no old business, moving to new business, let's go into the new UPWP. Yes. Is that screen sharing correctly? Yeah. That's half the battle is actually sharing my screen correctly. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. Uh, SMTC staff developed the uh, next year's Unified Planning Work Program. A uh, letter was sent out to member agencies on September 24th, uh, functioning as a call letter and a draft program has been put together. Two attachments were included in your packet that you received either in postal mail or an email, and they included the uh, program summary table, as well as an operating budget. 
the actual full document was not included in the mail. It was uh, a link to that was on our website it's because it was too large to email, and I didn't want to waste the paper and you know, doing that. So I'm going to go through a quick overview now of the of the program. So for those of you who are new, the UPWP or Unified Planning Work Program is our annual work items undertaken by the SMTC in support of our long range transportation plan. And it provides a mechanism for the coordination of our planning efforts in the area. The most important thing that it does is it details the annual use of federal highway and federal transit funds in the SMTC area. So first I'm gonna go over the significant projects that were completed in the past year. So, uh, these have all been brought before this committee in the past year. They are the City of Syracuse Safety Assessment, the 2021 Public Participation Plan, the Town of Skinny Atlas Eastern Gateway Concept, uh, our annual Bridge and Pavement Condition Management uh, System. And then uh, last three are on today's agenda after this. They are our LRTP amendment related to the ID1 needs, the Safe Roads to School White Paper, and the Tuscarora Road Corridor Study. Other accomplishments of the past year that are either recurring or mandated activities related to public participation. We uh, maintained and updated our website, uh, actually did a lot of significant website updates. We presented that at a previous planning committee last time we gathered about uh, the interactive map and we put on our website um, for that. We've uh, published uh, at least one hard copy newsletter the past year over the summertime and six e-newsletters that have gone out. And we've expanded our use of virtual public involvement uh, like everybody else has had to do recently. Also in terms of public outreach, we initiated a new forum called the Forum on Active Transportation. We've held three virtual meetings to date. We have one more meeting scheduled for later this month. Um, it seems to be a very successful forum. Um, we have guest speakers talking about various active transportation things that are happening in our community and uh, had a good deal of engagement from the public on that. We begin the initial uh, analysis and presentation of 2020 census data. There's some basic information available on our website through interactive mapping. Um, more of the detailed information from the 2020 census will be forthcoming. But there is some of that available on our website right now. In terms of data collection for the city and the county traffic count program, we have a new consultant on board that's been retained uh, to assist us with traffic count information. Uh, this is our fifth year of doing comprehensive counts for the city and the county to try and build up um, an SMTC-wide database of relatively recent counts for us to have. Um, some of the city and the county counts got older than we'd like to see them. So this is a way of keeping them all up to date so that we have a better understanding of our transportation utilization right now. Um, that New York State DOT main office is assisting greatly with that. And uh, in-house here, we've been in, uh, greatly enhancing our uh, database functionality to be able to manage and uh, serve out those count requests when they come in. In terms of GIS, we've created a bunch of new interactive maps. Again, we demonstrated at previous committee meetings related to the work products portfolio, environmental justice mapper, the ITS inventory. Um, other items include the uh, truck route signage, uh, sidewalk condition ratings for the city of Syracuse and intersection attributes. We've assisted the regional planning board with some broad bad inventory mapping as one of their projects and worked with the statewide GIS working group. Uh, one item that is being finalized this week as we speak. Actually, the proof is on our, our table down the hall from me right now is the Onondaga County map update. It was last done in 2016. We received a request from Onondaga County to update that map. It is All the work has been done. It is at the printers. Plan and print was awarded the contract. Uh, we're signing up on the proof today and expect to get delivery later this month. Uh, the bridge and pavement uh, condition management system. Uh, this is an annual work item that we do. This has an add-on which includes complete citywide pavement condition ratings. Uh, the city asked us to do that for all of their streets in the city of Syracuse, not just the federal aid eligible ones. Um, the product also includes an analysis of bridge and pavement ratings. Uh, this is the third year that we've done com comprehensive ratings for the city of Syracuse and they use those ratings to kind of, with additional analysis that we provide them to help prioritize their paving projects. All this information is entered into GIS and is posted on our interactive a website map. Additionally, we would, uh, do a city sidewalk condition ratings at the request of the city of Syracuse. This involves a vast field work effort where I retain summer interns and they're armed with iPads and they literally walk the city of Syracuse streets collecting sidewalk data. It is done parcel by parcel. And so far they've done 350 plus miles of city sidewalk uh, and there's a lot more to go still. <laughs> and that'll be going on this, this summer as well. 
for MPO regional planning initiatives. Um, we are assisting SACPA with the Empire State Trail Local Economic Opportunities Plan. And we have to come up with shorter names for our projects because that is way too long. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing that plan um, in the next month or two. It's a guideline basically to add bicycle and pedestrian improvements to tap into the economic opportunities that are available because of the state's Empire State Trail. Um, we have our travel demand modeling. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with that, that is our computer tool that we can do what if scenario planning with. Uh, what if you do this to the transportation system? What if you do that to the land use system? What will traffic do in response to that, both now and in the future? So uh, in the past year, we've utilized that for uh, Route 11 Mandydale project, as well as the Village of Skinny Atlas project for uh, we've done a select link, in origin, select link analysis to help us identify origin and destination travels as well as utilized NPMRDS data for um, studies on uh, Route 5 in Chittenango and Route 20 in Skinny Atlas. The Transportation Improvement Program, that is our capital program. That's where all of the funds get programmed for uh, expenditure in our community, all of our capital projects. We've worked on maintaining that program, processing amendments as required. Most importantly, worth pointing out is 100% of funds that were able to be obligated this past year had been, had been obligated. That amounted to $76.162 million. Um, it might sound obvious that you'd always want to obligate 100% of your money, but it's like to tell everybody we didn't always do that. And in years past, not 100% of the funds were obligated. So that means we missed an opportunity for investment in our local community. So we try real hard now to make sure that that never happens and 100% of the possible funds to be expended in our community are expended in our community. So we hit that goal again this year with $76 million. We are in the process of updating a new TIP schedule right now. We expect to bring that back to this committee over the summertime um, for adoption sometime in the summer of 2022. For the proposed work program, it's a little bit over $2 million. 1.6 of that is uh, FHWA and FTA funds, 50,000 of which is probably not gonna be spent. That's FHWA planning funds that are go to the New York State MPO Association. We were supposed to host a planning conference here in Syracuse, but with the state of public health, I, I doubt that's going to be occurring in the next year, so that will remain unspent. And $400,000 has been uh, given by New York State DOT for uh, state planning and research funds to assist with the Dome Special Event Study, which I'll talk about later on. We have eight major projects plus recurring efforts that are carrying over from the previous program and nine new projects. So um, member agencies and municipal officials were notified for a call for projects for planning assistance. We held virtual meetings just like this with anyone who was thinking about submitting a project. So we can kind of give them a guide in terms of whether their idea was good or not for a transportation planning project. Um, we gathered that information, assembled what we could for a program and put it out for 30 day public comment. It's on our website right now. It's the same one that you've been looking, you had the opportunity to review for today's meeting. And now a legal notice was published in the newspaper. So taking a look at projects that are underway right now, the current program ends March 31st, 2022, and the new one starts April 1st. So there's gonna be projects that are rolling over past the end of March 31st. Uh, they include the joint TMC co-location. That project will be done in the first quarter of 2022. This is a very interesting project that looks at the possibility of co-locating city, county, and state facilities for transportation management center. Right now, the city operates its own center, the state operates its own center, the county is not really operating them. TMC at the moment. This is looking at the feasibility of, can we have one center that services all three people, all three entities rather, correctly? And this is the first of a many steps. This is basically a, a white paper that examines that. If we decide to move forward, we need, we need a full feasibility study would be the next step. And we have the Dome Traffic Management and Event Strategic Plan. This is the project New York State DOT has uh, contributed $400,000 to the cost of. This is a consultant-led study. The whole concept here is to examine um, if ID1 changes, how do you get to special events on the hill, specifically to the dome? Um, so we've been working with a consultant on that for the past year. Uh, we conducted numerous small group meetings and interviews with stakeholders and uh, case study review and literature review. Um, we've done a survey of uh, existing user experiences and the consultant uh, did a site visit for a game in October to, uh, to check that out. There is a programmed pause into this project to wait until New York State DOT's decision is finalized so that we don't, right now everything was leading up to, okay, what are the changes for ID1? And now we're gonna pause until we know what the changes for ID1 are going to be before the project then picks up. 
Uh, also carrying over is the Maddiedale Route 11 corridor study. Um, we anticipate that project being done in the first quarter of 2022. So far, we've conducted a full build-out assessment of that area based on a hypothetical zoning change, as well as utilize our travel demand model for our two road scenarios that include full build-out assumptions. And we developed conceptual examples of big picture ideas for four of the large areas. We have on uh, January 31st, a uh, public outreach, virtual public outreach Q&A is set, scheduled just like this where people can call, connect via Zoom and ask questions as well as it's gonna be streamed on YouTube. And right now there's a, a public presentation people can view on our YouTube channel that they can watch at their leisure before the Q&A so that they can go in there well informed. The Manlius Village Center Pedestrian Study and Safety and Mobility. We held two virtual staff meetings and two business specific meetings uh, over the past year, um, completed existing conditions and development of issues, and we're currently developing the draft recommendations and that will be completed in the first quarter of 2022 as well. Village of Skimmy Atlas Pedestrian Safety and Access Study. We just held the virtual Q&A for that this week on uh, the 18th of this month. Um, that PowerPoint was out there for the public to watch on YouTube for, for a couple, couple weeks beforehand. Um, we anticipate that project being done in the first quarter as well. So next time we get together, all these projects that you've heard me talk about, we'll be presenting those to you. Some other projects that are rolling over uh, for, for safety directed projects, we have the Syracuse School Loading Zone and the Syracuse Safe Routes to School. Those efforts are significantly delayed because of COVID and the schools, as you might've figured out, have a lot on their plate right now and talking to us is not on their list of things to do right now. So this is really being delayed because of that. We have to wait until they, they return to more normal operations before we can bother them with these, these items. The Syracuse Residential Parking Permit Study. This, uh, we've completed the data collection and uh, drafted a white paper of example programs. Public input sessions are anticipated in the coming months. Uh, they'll probably take the first half of 2022 to uh, complete. So looking at new programs for the coming year, Centro submitted a few. One of them is a uh, survey where we're going to gather socioeconomic data required by uh, FTA for Centro, and that'll be an onboard survey. Another is assisting Centro with public outreach, where they'd like us to hold and summarize public outreach efforts related to community thoughts on a mass public transportation system for our area. The downtown committee asked us to take a look at downtown intersection safety, examining some additional intersections in downtown uh, Syracuse for uh, safety issues and what could be done to make them better. Town of Gettys proposed a Westvale Plaza revitalization. This is uh, building up of a concept plan already developed for Westvale Plaza. City of Syracuse has requested the Cold Brook Creek Trail city for, in the city and to explore and document existing facilities and use um, along the right of way. Similarly, they requested the West Side Trail uh, for the city of Syracuse, which is uh, Fayette Street and Art Park area. Um, we're looking at the possibility of the Community Streets Program. This is building off of the Community Streets Guide that was developed in, uh, by SMTC in 2020. This is gonna look at the possibility of launching a pilot program in the city of Syracuse and what it would take to make that happen. Uh, it's gonna be try and modeled after the Capital Coexist Program that exists in Albany, which is very successful. Uh, we're going to study Route 11, apparently, from the northern part of the county, right until we get out of Onondaga County, one, one, one study at a time. The next piece of it is going to be uh, the Nedro portion of Route 11. Uh, SACPA asked us to take a look at that, uh, address transportation needs of area residents and commuters. We'll look at safety, transit, uh, bike and pet infrastructure. Uh, this is a small examination of the possibility of a rail to trail evaluation in the Martisco Rail area. Um, Evaluate level of interest in implementing a trail connection between Camillus and Marcellus. And SACPA had a variety of requests for us that actually weren't really projects in and of themselves, but they were just kind of additional assistance. We kind of put them all together under a block funded assistance area for SACPA. They include um, assisting them with their plan on Indaga, which is their, their new comprehensive plan that they're developing, as well as agritourism planning will assist them with their efforts that are I'll be honest, are to be determined. I'm not really sure what those are going to be yet. Uh, begin a feasibility study of a multi-mobility app that they've asked us to take a look at, as well as assistance with the creation of educational materials for roundabouts and uh, potential transit-oriented development assistance for analysis for that. So that's all of our program right there. Everything in white is uh, either mandated or recurring. Everything that's in kind of that gray-blue color those are projects that are individual projects that are that, that come and go as they're completed. 
total cost for this program is $1.6 million. Uh, we have about 1.57 of available funding, it leaves a shortfall of 63,000, which is made up from carryover funds from last year that are uh, available for me to program this year. Similarly, there'll be some monies left over in the year we're in right now. I'm guessing in the neighborhood of 50,000 plus or minus 10,000, but I'll roll over into a future year. Additionally, we have 400,000 from the state being programmed for the dome events study. Uh, and so in the end, we have a balanced budget and a very large work program. And I'll be honest with you, most of those projects I said to you will not be completed in the 2023, 2020, I'm sorry, the 2022, 2023 program, but a lot of them will carry over into the following year of 2023, 2024, just because it's a very large work program. And I'm sure a few staff like everybody else these days. So questions or comments on the presentation or on the UPWP or any project at all that we're working on, please go ahead. I hear no questions. All right. Would anybody like to, do we need to make a motion on this or just? Yeah, we may need to make a movement motion for policy committee. Okay. Dave Botar, can we get a second? Brian I'll second. Oh, thank you. All right. Any opposed? We'll do it that way. Okay, hearing no opposition, we will consider this passed. Thank you. Yeah, and thanks for working all of those requests into your work program. Especially we'll, we we'll be in touch with you, Megan. You have a lot of that. Yeah, it sounds like the city's got some works to do too, Neil. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, so next on the agenda is the 2050 LRTP update. Yep. Um, purpose here is to have the planning committee recommend that the policy committee adopt the uh, long range transportation plan uh, amendment for the 2020 plan. We are required to update the LRTP every five years. It was last adopted in 20, September of 2020. An amendment is now proposed in response to the release of uh, DOT's I 81 viaduct, uh, DEIS. The proposed amendment consists of two elements. Additional transportation system performance measures that are required every time we touch the LRTP, we have to update those. Right. And the other is item specific to the IED1 Viaduct project. Megan Vitale will give a brief presentation on what's in the amendment. Okay, you see the slides? Yeah. Yes. Okay, All right. okay so as Jim already mentioned, um, our 2015 LRTP was our first entirely new LRTP since um, 1995. Um, and that was the first one to comply with the new performance-based planning requirements. Um, we updated that as required in 2020. Uh, so our next update would be due in 2025, but we are proposing an amendment right now to incorporate the um, I-81 projects into the financial analysis of the 2020 update. And that necessitates that we update the system performance report as well. So we have two components to this amendment. So again, why are we recommending it now? Our next required update would be in 2025, but with the release of the uh, I-81 draft design report, DEIS in July, 2021, that identified the community grid as the preferred alternative um, and propose that to be completed as a series of projects. Currently, uh, the I-81 viaduct project is identified as a regionally significant uh, project um, and as an illustrative project in the long range plan. But the individual projects that will make up the community grid alternative need to be added eventually to the SMTC's TIP, um, but that necessitates that they be first included in the fiscally constrained portion of the long range plan. Um, in other words, they can't just be illustrative projects. Uh, the purpose of the long range plan has not changed. So again, the only thing that we would be really amending would be the financial plan, um, the regionally significant projects list. Uh, this still remains the same. The I-81 viaduct project is identified there as a regionally significant project. Um, and we, in the 2020 update, acknowledged progress on these other regionally significant projects as well. 
So the LRTP amendment, again, consists of an addendum to chapter four. So this is an addition to the system performance report that is chapter four um, of the document. And this includes new transit safety targets that were adopted in June of 2021 um, and updated highway safety targets that were adopted in October. That's required just because we're making um, any changes to the, the LRTP right now. Uh, and then the revised financial analysis um, includes the community grid phase one and phase two projects within the short and the midterm um, of the financial analysis, additional anticipated revenue, uh, a new fiscal constraint analysis, um, and then revisions to the text that move the I-81 projects out of the illustrative project section and into the fiscally constrained section. So uh, this just shows the short-term um, highway project costs. And you can see that we have added uh, five projects uh, associated with phase one of the I-81 viaduct project uh, for a total of 800 million. And then in the midterm timeframe of the long range plan, we have added another five projects uh, that total 1.1 billion. The long-term timeframe of the long range plan, um, <laughs> kind of redundant, but uh, that is really focused on maintenance uh, and these costs have not changed. So these are consistent with the 2020 update. Um, all of the financial plan changes were to the short and midterm timeframes only. So this shows the, the overall breakdown of the project cost by category. Uh, the long range plan um, as proposed in the amendment would now include a total of over $5 billion in projects with 42% of that for highway system maintenance, 13% uh, for transit maintenance and 45% for non-maintenance projects. This table shows the fiscal constraint analysis. So it's showing uh, a, surpl a surplus of about um, $28 million, but overall in the total costs and revenues, um, this is a very small percentage, but does show that we are fiscally constrained. So the uh, draft documents for this uh, proposed amendment uh, were available on our, our website and a video presentation was available on our YouTube channel um, starting October 25th. Public comments were accepted through November 30th. Uh, we issued a press release to local media, um, a legal notice, an email blast went out, multiple Facebook posts and hard copy letters were mailed to the um, environmental and transportation related agencies uh, as required for consultation. Uh, we only received two comments uh, from the public. We did respond to those. Oh, I think my slide timing was a little fast. Um, one of those was from the Port of Oswego, and we did uh, meet with uh, the gentleman from Port of Oswego and discussed his concerns. Uh, and the other one was actually just a public comment saying, I like what you guys are doing and I want more uh, bike accommodations in the region. Uh, so next steps, planning committee needs to recommend that the policy committee adopt the amendment um, and then policy committee hopefully will adopt the amendment and again, our next full update to the long range plan would be due in September of 2025. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Yep. Okay, any questions? Okay, so this is um, a recommendation that the policy committee adopt the proposed amendment. Um, so we're gonna need a vote on this one. So. Would anybody like to offer a motion? I'll move it. Dave Mankiewicz, anyone second? Second. Ed Mueller, thank you. Any in opposition? Hearing none, motion passed. Thank you very much. One step done. 100 million more steps to go. <laughs> All right. Uh, safe routes to school manual phase one, right? White yep. paper. Yep, the uh, staff, the planning committee recommend the uh, policy committee acknowledge completion of the draft white paper. Uh, this is done at the request of the city of Syracuse. Megan Vitalia will give a very brief presentation on this. 
Okay, I just have one slide for this one. Hopefully you're seeing that. Um, so this, this project as proposed um, had two phases. Uh, what we're asking for right now is acknowledgement of the completion of phase one. So this is the white paper, background research white paper uh, that we completed. So this documents ex some existing Safe Routes to School projects in the city and the region, um, includes some research into examples of public facing Safe Routes to School guides. So the ultimate goal of this project was to create a public facing guide for community groups or schools to implement their own Safe Routes to Schools projects in the city. So we've documented um, some examples of that um, and the existing transportation guidance um, from the Syracuse City School District. So that was reviewed by the study advisory committee and now we are looking for that to be acknowledged as complete uh, to close out phase one of this project. Phase two of the project will continue with uh, the development of that guidebook in parallel with a case study. Um, we are looking to work with one school within the SESD to uh, do kind of a test case to help us develop uh, the process that will be documented in that guidebook. Um, and as Jim alluded to earlier, we've had some difficulty getting a school to engage with that over the past year. So that has been on hold, um, but we would like to at least acknowledge completion of phase one of this project and continue with phase two when we're able to um, engage with the school administration. And that's it. So. Just a question, um, not having looked through this um, at all yet, is there any applicability to this um, for districts outside of the city of Syracuse? I know there's a wide range of sidewalk and pedestrian activity available to certain schools, but there's some out there that I would think might be able to take advantage. And is there any plan to distribute this any wider um, to other districts? Um, we don't have a plan for that at the moment. I mean, the, the white paper itself is fairly short. It documented really the work that um, Healthy Connections had done with the city of Syracuse already. Um, there's a couple examples in there from outside of the city. And then the examples of the public facing guidebook guidebooks um, are mostly from outside of the region. So certainly if another school district wanted to pursue that, um, they could. Um, some of them have very different transportation policies from the city of Syracuse, right? So, I mean, this was one of the, the reasoning, the reasoning behind this project is that, that a large portion of the city's students are required to walk to school. Um, so other school districts, if they wanted to pursue that as an option for their students, uh, certainly could uh, their guide, the ultimate guide for how a school district might do that might look a little different um, in the framework of a different municipality or a different district from what the city guide will look like. But I think it's a pretty, the, the white paper could be a fairly generic reference paper. Um, the guidebook I think would be ultimately more tailored to a specific district and or municipality. Yeah, I just wonder if this could be used to sort of get the the ideas flowing in some of the other districts as well, um, since you've created this product. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. Can I get a motion um, for the planning committee to recommend that the policy committee acknowledge completion of the white paper? So moved. Neil Burke, thank you. Do we have a second? I'll second. Cody Kelly, thank you. Um, any opposed? Hearing none, passed. Thank you. Okay, and last one, Tuscarora Road Corridor Study. Yep, um, again, the same uh, planning committee uh, to recommend that the policy committee acknowledge completion of this effort. The Tuscarora Road Study was completed on behalf of the village of Chittenango and the town of Sullivan in Madison County. Mario Colon will uh, give a brief presentation. Actually, he's gonna run the presentation, but it was pre-recorded by Aaron McKeon, who is no longer with staff here. So you mean, Aaron McKeon will be the voice that you'll hear. Yeah, I, I have the privilege of uh, hitting play. So uh, hopefully this works. Is 
This video will provide you with a brief introduction to the Syracuse Metropolitan Transportation Council's Tuscarora Road Corridor Study, undertaken at the request of the Town of Sullivan and the Village of Chittenango. In the summer of 2020, at the request of the Village of Chittenango and the Town of Sullivan, the SMTC kicked off a study of the Tuscarora Road Corridor. This included defining the study's scope of work, which was to explore ideas to make it safer for pedestrians and cyclists to use Tuscarora Road, to slow vehicles on Tuscarora down, and look for possible ways to make Tuscarora Road less attractive as a bypass of Route 5 through the village. This project's goals and objectives were developed in conjunction with a study advisory committee that included representatives of the village of Chittenango, the town of Sullivan, the Tuscarora Road Advisory Committee, Madison County's Planning Department, and the New York State Department of Transportation. The town of Manlius and Onondaga County was also involved. Additionally, the project team met with the Chittenango Rotary, uh -huh gathered input from the community by way of an online survey and held a virtual question and answer session via Zoom for interested community members. Tuscarora Road is a 2.2 mile two lane road that runs between Route 5 on the west end of the village and Route 5 on the east end of the village. Tuscarora Road is a popular route for east west commuters who are passing through the village but wish to bypass the signalized intersections on Route 5 through the village center. There are no stop signs or traffic signals on Tuscarora Road between its two intersections with Route 5. Tuscarora Road is classified as a major collector, which means that even though it is owned by the town and village, it is eligible to receive federal highway dollars. Driving lanes on Tuscarora Road are between 10 and 11 feet wide, which is appropriate for a two-lane road in a residential area. The road's shoulders are under four feet wide in most locations. A section of Stone Dust Trail has been added to the south side of Tuscarora in recent years. It currently runs between Talbert and Namick Drives. Another important aspect of this facility is that the bridge over Chittenango Creek has a weight restriction, which means that most large trucks are banned from using this bridge and thus cannot use Tuscarora to bypass the village's center. In December 2020, the SMTC worked with the village of Chittenango to circulate an online survey asking residents for input on safety on Tuscarora Road. Questions included, how often do you or someone in your household drive along Tuscarora Road? How would you rate Tuscarora's safety? And what improvements would you like to see? We received 387 responses to this survey, which helped us understand the issues that people who use the road every day have with the facility. The survey also asked respondents to rate the road safety for bikes and pedestrians on the same one to five scale. The average rating was 1.8, indicating that most residents feel that the road is extremely unsafe for cyclists and pedestrians. Many respondents pointed to the road's relatively narrow shoulders, the lack of sidewalks, and vehicle speeds. When asked what safety issues they have noticed with Tuscarora Road, specifically for bikes and pedestrians, the road's narrow width was by far the most popular response. Tuscarora Road's shoulders range in width from 2.5 feet to 5 feet. For comfortable walking, a consistent 5-foot shoulder would be needed. However, widening the existing road is not necessarily the ideal solution, particularly given residents' concerns with speeding. Most experts agree that a narrow road can help remind drivers to obey posted speed limits. The design concepts developed for this corridor took this issue into consideration. The survey results and discussions with stakeholders, including the Chittenango Rotary, the Tuscarora Road Advisory Committee, and Study Advisory Committee members, laid the foundation for a few design ideas for the corridor. To make it easier to think about this two-mile corridor, we split it into three sections, western, central, and eastern. We also focused on the issues that the community flagged in its survey responses, speeds, lack of space for pedestrians and cyclists, and new designs for the tuscarora Bolivar lake intersection. These concepts also include connections to major destinations in the community, such as the supermarket and pharmacy, and to the Chittenango Creek Walk Trail. West End Concept 1A proposes a trail along the south side of Tuscarora Road, extending from Route 5 to the existing trail east of Talbert Drive. This variation includes a connection along the east side of TomTom Tom Street, connecting to the Topps Plaza parking lot entrance. An off-road connection would give cyclists and pedestrians a safe way to get to the grocery store as well as to Route 5, which provides east-west access across the region. This concept would also include a raised crosswalk at Wheatfield Drive, with a pedestrian activated beacon for improved safety. A raised crosswalk at this location would slow vehicles down and give pedestrians greater visibility in the crosswalk. This concept also proposes adding gateway signage to the Route 5 Tuscarora Road intersection. 
Two concepts have been developed for this section, but they are very similar to one another. Both propose a pair of raised crosswalks located at Burning Hollow Drive and Namek Drive. Each crosswalk would have a pedestrian activated flashing beacon. This kind of beacon has been shown to significantly improve pedestrian safety in crosswalks. The crosswalk at Namek Drive would connect the existing trail to a new trail on the north side of the road that would run east to Chittenango Creek. Concept 1 also proposes to replace the existing Bolivar Lake intersection with a roundabout. The one location that survey responses flagged as a safety issue more than any other was the Bolivar Road Lake Street intersection with Tuscarora. Vehicles on Bolivar and Lake have stop signs, but vehicles on Tuscarora do not. Also, this intersection sits at the bottom of a small gully, and vehicles approaching from the south, west, and east are coming down hills. Survey responses identified several safety concerns at this intersection, including the relatively fast speeds of vehicles on Tuscarora, the intersection's skew, poor visibility, and from the perspective of drivers on Tuscarora, risky behaviors by vehicles on the side streets using undersized gaps in traffic to turn or cross the road. One concept that would correct some of this intersection's issues, improve safety, and slow vehicles on Tuscarora Road down is a modern roundabout. Only one concept was developed for this section of Tuscarora Road, but it includes a number of elements worth considering either separately or as a package. One key element is to fill in the missing sidewalk section on the north side of Tuscarora, which would involve closing off the off-street parking for the businesses on the north side of the road and replacing it with on-street parking. There's also an opportunity to create a unique community gateway at the Race Street Tuscarora Road intersection where the new Creek Walk extension will cross Tuscarora Road. A raised intersection at this location would improve pedestrian safety, slow vehicles down, and draw attention to the Creek Walk's northern end. Another improvement for both pedestrians and drivers would be to add overhead lighting along this portion of the road. This sketch shows what this idea might look like on the far eastern end of Tuscarora Road. This concept includes a new footbridge over Chittenango Creek parallel to the existing vehicle crossing. The Race Street Manor Drive intersection is now a raised intersection. And instead of a large asphalt parking area between Manor Drive and Route 5, there's a sidewalk, on-street parking, and green space. Since it would involve changes to access and existing off-street parking, this would be a long-term plan for this section of the road. Thank you for your time. We're happy to answer any questions. Yeah, great presentation. Um, any questions from the crowd? Okay. Anyone like to make a motion that planning committee recommend policy committee acknowledge completion of the corridor study for Tuscarora Road? Motion. Oh. Thanks, Dave Botar. Anybody else? Can I get a second? Second it. Thank you, Ed Mueller. All right, any opposed? Okay, motion passed. All right, any other business, Jim? No, just want to remind everybody that there's a policy committee meeting February 10th, uh, where the next phase of today's agenda will be repeated. <laughs> Sounds good. All right, with that, meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Time. Public comment, Jim. Just, just to I'm sorry. A no, you're okay. Oops. No, sorry. my fault. Yeah, I, I forgot. I forget with the streaming. Yeah, we've been we've been streaming this to YouTube. Um, so, are there any comments that are coming in off the YouTube channel that need to be read into the record? Uh, nothing right now. Just give it about you know 30 seconds or so because it does delay. Um, but I haven't seen anything come through just yet. But uh, after that, if there's nothing, I, I will let you all know. So. Sorry, 30 second streaming delay for YouTube. <laughs>